Morning. 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 Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, most of you know that I spend a lot of time researching for my sermons. That's not a surprise. Normally, I don't give anybody credit unless I quote them directly. However, uh, I do need to give credit to Pastor Chuck Swindle. Um, Insight for Living, is that right? I think that's his ministry. And uh, a pastor that I couldn't find his name, but he's the pastor of Corn Tassel CP Church. Uh, I borrowed heavily, so I wanted to give credit, but I'm very much using their outlines. Um, so, that said, please don't judge me too harshly. This is indeed my own original sermon. With that said, one day, four pastors were uh, discussing and waxing eloquently. Uh, it's dangerous to get us together. Um, and the conversation turns to the translations of the Bible. And one pastor says, well, I prefer the King James Version because of the eloquent use of the English language. It's just poetry. And another one said, well, that may be so, but you can't match the New American Standard Version for its faithfulness to the Greek and Hebrew texts. <laughs> the third says, well, maybe so, but the NIV is superior for its readability and ease of understanding. And the three, you know, <laughs> and finally the fourth kind of looked at them at the end of the silence and said, you know, it was actually my mother's translation of the Bible that I liked the best. The first pastor looked at him and said, I didn't know your mother translated the Bible. <laughs> this fourth pastor looked back and he said, well, of course she did. She translated it every single day. And her attitudes and her behavior and the faith that she modeled. Indeed, it was the faith that she modeled that taught me how to have saving faith. In my Savior. Isn't it profound the effect that mothers have on us and how they translate the Bible into their daily lives, teaching us about character and faith and morality and walking with Jesus? It seems so natural to them. And so we wonder how does that work? How do believing grandmothers and mothers translate the Bible in their daily lives? And so today, in honor and celebration of Mother's Day, we're going to be looking at Timothy's grandmother and mother, whose own translation of the scriptures impacted this man, who we all know his name 2,000 years later. Now, at the outset, I must also add that we talk about mothers and grandmothers among the church family in a little different way. Because whether you are a biological mother and grandmother, or God has never blessed you with your own biological children, you're just one of the many ladies of the church who make a profound impact on our children. All y'all are mothers in God's family, that is the church. So, happy Mother's Day. As we begin, we look to a background of Timothy. Now, this is by no means exhaustive, but here's it down and dirty. We first meet Timothy in Acts, when Paul meets him. Acts 16, 1 through 3. He also, that's Paul, came to Derby and Lystra. A disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers and Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So, we've met Timothy. He already, we see, has the respect of the fellow believers around him. We don't know how old he is, but we can be sure that uh, he had a solid understanding of the scriptures and that he demonstrated his walk of faith because we see that he had the respect of all the other brothers and sisters in his township and surrounding communities. Further, we can be sure that Paul isn't going to just snatch Joe Schmo and go on a missionary journey with him. 
Throughout the next several chapters of Acts, we read how Timothy demonstrates the appropriateness of Paul's choosing him. We see that Timothy is a useful helper to Paul and his ministry, and a special bond grows between these two. Indeed, it's thought that the last Paul line run. The last letter from Paul that we have was to Timothy. Um, so, clearly there is an important bond that was formed there between these two men. In chapter 17, to illustrate Timothy's importance, we see Paul is telling Silas and Timothy to come and join him as soon as possible. They are separated because of a riot. Uh, in Acts 19, we see that Timothy is met to, Macedonius, to Macedonia with Erastus. Uh, these two men are eventually going to end up in Thessalonica and working with that church there, and they bring news to Paul that causes Paul to write the letter to the Thessalonians. We see uh, of Timothy that he's named individually in Acts chapter 20 as Paul and his companions are traveling to Jerusalem. And that is kind of the last, uh, in Acts, the cohesive story of Paul's ministry where we see Timothy. It causes me to wonder uh, where Timothy then ended up because we see in Romans 16.21, Paul says Timothy is a dear co-worker. Um, Paul, uh, in 1 Corinthians 4, 17, Paul says he is a dear and faithful son in the Lord. He is listed as the co-sender of 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. He is also the recipient of Paul's, what we think are his one and two final letters, possibly letters right in between those two. So, we see the remarkable impact that Timothy had on the early church. We see that he was clearly a dedicated servant of the Lord. So we've seen that Timothy is a dedicated servant of the Lord. Now as we examine the scriptures, we are given a few clues as to what laid the foundation of this man's faith and character. And so as we look at these clues this morning, we see the clear translation of the scriptures which his grandmother and mother demonstrated for him. And so we begin, we see that mothers teach sincere faith. Mothers teach sincere faith. And as we look at 2 Timothy 1, 5, we read, I recall your sincere faith that was alive first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure is in you. Eunice and Lois teach Timothy first to have faith in Jesus. They taught him the importance of coming to an understanding of him as the Messiah, as his Lord and Savior. See, in essence, Paul is saying, Timothy, I know your grandmother. Her faith was authentic. And I know your mother. And after having watched you for this amount of time, I am also convinced that your faith is sincere, is authentic also. And to describe this faith, Paul uses uh, the word here translated as genuine or sincere. But the word means without hypocrisy. And I wonder, just as an aside, how many of us have faith that might be described as without hypocrisy? Because that's the difficulty with faith, right? Not only saying it, but actually living it out. Do our actions Monday through Saturday reflect what we profess on Sunday morning? We say that God is sovereign, but when things don't go our way, how much time and effort do we spend engineering and manipulating the situation that we might exert our own control over it, rather than prayerfully considering what is God calling us to do or not do? What might his plan in this situation be to glorify himself? We say we trust that salvation is by faith alone, but how many of us are secretly laboring, trying to earn our way to heaven through our good works? I'll give you guys a really challenging one. What happens when a loved one gets sick? What do we do first? Do we panic, drop everything, and run to the doctor? Or do we panic and drop everything and fall to our knees? Plead with the great physician to heal.
healed. I'm obviously not saying don't go to the doctor. I'm saying that our attitude towards God as sovereign healer. I think there's a statement there. So, Lois and Eunice showed Timothy by their own translation of the scriptures, by word and example, what it means to be women of faith, what it means to have a faith feet free from hypocrisy, the real thing, genuine and sincere. Mothers and grandmothers, I can't overstate how important your demonstration of true faith is to your children and grandchildren. Though I'm sure you all know this, I wonder if you realize the extent to which these different relationships affect all of us. It's so crucial. Mothers, with their loving discipline and their instruction, with the selfless things that you do day in and day out to take care of your children, are constantly pursuing God, constantly endeavoring to love your children better, constantly endeavoring to mold them into little Christians that are going to also, you know, be moral and ethical and glorify God. Grandmothers, there's something special about grandmothers. Their unconditional love and patience that never wears out. The advice that they're able to offer, which is only found from experience, I can say from my own life, the profound impact that a grandmother has, seeing her translation of the scriptures on me, first through her prayer, which must have been daily, you've met me, you know how much prayer I need, and second, through her advice and her steady confidence that the Lord is good, that he has a plan and a purpose for his children that he loves. What higher accolade or greater tribute could be given to any of our mothers this morning than for their children to say to them, you showed me genuine faith. You showed me this authentic faith. You demonstrated to me the real deal, Mama. That's pretty good. Now, we all know that teaching children to trust Christ is not easy, nor without cost. So let us see what Susan Wesley has to say. This is the mother of John and Charles Wesley. You probably know those names. If you don't, look them up. They had a profound impact on the church. She has six rules that she offers. First, subdue self-will in children. Good luck. <laughs> Two, teach them to pray as soon as they can speak. Three, give them nothing they cry for and only what is good for them when they ask politely. Four, punish no fault confessed, but let no sinful act go unnoticed. Five, reward good behavior. Six, strictly observe all the promises you have made to your child. How far are we? Not 100 all of you. <laughs> Mothers model power, love, and self-control. Mothers model power, love, and self-control. As we continue in 2 Timothy, and skip one verse and come to the next, verse 7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And so we see that it is from the Holy Spirit, who himself is not fearful, but is of power and love and self-control, that equips believers here Timothy. And we know that it is the Holy Spirit who uses those around us, who we receive our training in life from, to focus on love and self-discipline. Now, who is closer to teaching and training than mom? There's something to the old saying, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. In short, it means that women have far more influence and power than most people are willing to admit, especially us men. The truth is that mom is the closest and the most important in the raising and training for righteousness of their children. Mothers are the molders and makers 
of children and of their everyday. We remember the ways that Mother helped us prepare for life, day by day, with her steady, consistent counseling, advice, training, discipline, teaching, loving, and this shaped us, this formed us into the men and women that we become. E. Stanley Jones, I don't know who that is, but you can look him up if you want, explains the power of a mother this way. The mother usually hoists the sails of the family ship every day. We determine whether those sails shall catch the breezes of God's love and understanding or the winds of bickering and discord. So easily we see where children learn about the Spirit's power of love and self-control. That is, from their mothers. Now think for a moment what you learned from your own mother. And for many of us, indeed probably most of us, it was they who taught us what it means to be a loving and caring person and what it means to be love. It's my opinion, but I would surmise that most men who have any tenderness have it because their mothers taught it to them. Here's a bit of trivia for you. William Frederick Dunkel Jr. points out that of the 69 kings of France, only three of them were actually loved by their subjects. Interestingly, but not uh, unconsequentially, those are the three that were raised by their mothers, not tutors or nurses or guardians. How interesting. Timothy's everyday life was molded by his grandmother and mother. It was molded by their daily translations of the scriptures. And Paul reminds us of Timothy that he has seen the sincere faith transmitted to him through them. This is a training where he was opened to the word of the Holy Spirit, that is the spirit of power, love, and self-control, specifically through the demonstration by his grandmother and mother. Finally, we see that mothers teach the scriptures. This is another part of the heritage of Timothy's mother and grandmother who gave him this knowledge. As we turn to chapter 3, we'll start in verse 14. Paul says to Timothy, you, however, must continue in the things you have learned and are confident about. You know who taught you and how from infancy you have known the holy writings, which are able to give you wisdom <coughs> for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, I emphasize it, but don't miss it. You know who taught you. Aha! Grandmother and mother taught you the scriptures because the scriptures are God's powerful tool to influence children's lives for good. Especially so when a mother, a grandmother, perhaps another parent is the instructor. You might be familiar with the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child that's become quite common amongst those who have a certain ideology these days. And while it is true it does take more than one person to raise a child, the benefit uh, of the village here is necessarily contingent on who the village is made up of. In short, if the village is the world, then we need to understand that the world will not teach our children the right values. However, I skipped one. If that village is the world, it teaches through the culture, the TVs, the movies, the music, the education system, the higher education system, the institutions that be. They teach that the world uh, is corrupt. It teaches our children that the ultimate values are money and prosperity and power and fame and glory. And worse yet, it teaches that morality is relative. Morality is all based on how you feel about it. But, if your village is the church, 
then we will be using the scriptures to teach. And the scriptures are good. This is why God gave them, gave them to us. Paul uh, verbatim explains this in the next verse. It says, Every scripture is inspired by God and useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It may take a village, but it must be the right village. And the Christian village is made up of the family. I learned a really big word that describes the family. The buzzword is the nuclear family. The nuclear family is mom and dad and kids. And there's a word that means the extended family, but I don't remember it. So, <laughs> when we talk about the family in the church, we do mean mom and dad and kids. And we also mean grandma and grandpa and great grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews. And furthermore, when we talk about the church family, we actually look left and right and say, oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, grandmas and grandpas and moms and dads, brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles, our fellow believers of all ages indeed make up this Christian family. And it starts with mothers and grandmothers, patiently teaching their children, using the scriptures to instruct to teach, to reprove, to correct, to train in righteousness. It brings me to emphasize the importance of the individual mother. If on the one hand we have the world that gets our children, whatever, at least at school, or at least here, or at least there, basically all the time, anytime they're not you know, holding your hand. On the other hand, we have the mom who has the direct connection to the child. We see that we must not leave it to our Sunday school teachers to do the training and instructing and using the scriptures. But rather, as a mother and as a father, we must find ourselves using the scriptures to instruct and teach at every opportunity. Uh, I'm reminded of, I think it's Deuteronomy, but I can't give you the reference. Uh, anyway, it says you will train your children in the law, and write it upon their hearts. You talk about it when you rise and when you lay down and when you're walking along the way. And basically what Moses is saying, or God is saying through him, is all the time meditate on my scripture. And that's our job, parents, all the time to be continuously instilling, whether actually using words or using our Bible translation through our action, words, and deeds. The training for righteousness takes place especially when mothers and grandmothers consistently and conscientiously impart scriptural knowledge, when they live out their translation of the scriptures, and when young people continually hear from their mothers and grandmothers that the most important thing in life is to keep a right relationship with God. Eunice taught her son the scriptures starting at a very young age. Jewish boys typically started formal instruction at the age of five. Younger than that is not too soon. I already gave my daughter her first Bible lesson. <clears throat> Jesus loves her and died for her and rose again from the dead. And that she can have eternal life believing in him. Lois and Eunice gave Timothy the best translation of the Bible they could. They lived it out in their lives. This demonstration of faith in Christ, of how to love and how to be self-disciplined and to know the scriptures, it transformed Timothy. It transformed a man who had a profound, really not even adequately recorded effect on the church. What a great translation may be. We should never underestimate the influence of the godly mother and grandmother. As someone has said, right on the hearts of uh, mothers and grandmothers, right on the hearts of their children, but the rough hands of the world cannot erase. So let me give a couple of real examples. John Quincy Adams says, all that I am, my mother made me. Abraham Lincoln adds, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Dwight Moody says, all that I have ever accomplished in life, I owe to my mother. See, a godly mother has a profound influence on her children. It was Lord Shaftesbury, who's another person I'd never heard of, 
who said, Give me a generation of Christian mothers, and I will undergo the charge of changing the world. What a profound influence grandmothers and mothers have on us. So, it is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Your application is to say thank you to your mother for how she has demonstrated to you the translation of the scriptures. And as we have celebrated Mother's Day today, we answer the question, how do we believe, how do believing mothers and, uh, words are hard. How do believing grandmothers and mothers translate the Bible? And as we looked uh, at Timothy, and the impacts of his mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice, we see that believing grandmothers and mothers are the best translators of the Bible. They do so by living out the Bible, by demonstrating it with sincere faith, by modeling power, love, and self-control, and by teaching the scriptures. So mothers, grandmothers, happy Mother's Day. Know that as we celebrate you today, you are a powerful force, especially for the church. We're thankful for you. Would you pray with me? Lord our God, thank you for mothers. Thank you for grandmothers. Thank you for the way you designed your church and, your, and the family and the way that you have uh, caused mothers and grandmothers to hold these so important of positions with their children. That by their living out the Bible translation, with their example of their daily lives, with their love and their patience, they etch upon us the quality and character that you desire in your children. What a terrific responsibility. And we are so thankful for them. We are so thankful for the way that you use them to form us, to love us, to build us up. Father, I do just pray for each mother here this morning, each mother in your church, that you would give them your peace that surpasses understanding, that you would draw them near to you, that you would continue to stir their hearts and spur them on, give them the encouragement that they need. Lord, let us as a church love them well, that they may know their value. Let them know that they are appreciated and treasured. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name.